it's me again. Lee is still poorly, but he's recovering and we are going to have him back. And we're always sending out our best wishes to him and his nose or whatever it is. Um, poor, old, poor old you, Lee. The great news is that we have yet again our fantastic deputy CPAT CEO, Neil Lampert, uh, helping me out. Before we get on to our guest, how are you doing, Neil? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm super duper. How was the speed awareness course? Yes, I revealed on the last podcast that I've been naughty and caught doing 28 and a 20 limit in um, Crystal Palace. I don't know, anyone who regularly has trouble switching between Zoom and Teams might relate to this because I turned up, clicked the link and immediately got an error message on Teams. And so I rang in a blind panic the um, course providers. It turns out they'd sent a link that was broken to all people who are on this course. <laughs> so you, you had about 15 people desperately ringing this service centre, uninstalling and reinstalling teams, and it was total chaos for about half an hour. Um, but I finally got onto the course and learnt a few things. Are you now more aware of speed? It's easy to be cynical, isn't it, about these courses, but I did actually learn a few things I didn't know. I'm sure you relearned them, Neil, from when you took your test, because I remember thinking, absolutely, oh, <laughs> that, that equation for stopping distance, like that's something you're going to be doing on the motorway. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm point. rubbish at maths at the best of times. <laughs> I reckon I know where you got done in Crystal Palace, by the way, because um, is it up, kind of up the top? There's a road that leads up to it that goes towards Forest Hill. Was it that bit there? Because it looks like a really You know what, road, it might it? be. I'm still not quite sure where it was. I mean, obviously, the name of the road was on the uh, the ticket, but... Yeah. Anyway, good for you for demonstrating civic awareness and speed awareness. Um, and um, don't, do it, don't do it again. No. Good. Lee Davis and Gwilym Roberts are the two IPs in a pod. And you are listening to a podcast on intellectual property brought to you by the Chartered Institute of Patent Attorneys. Right. Well, delighted to introduce our guest now, um, Vandita Chandrani from Elector. Uh, we don't often have in-house attorneys, and we we're quite excited when we we're talking to Vandita about the possibility of doing this, because it's partly driven by a fantastic article in, Vandita, was it Patent Lawyer magazine? Patent Lawyer magazine, yes, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. That's obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm old mates with you, we do some work with you and everything else, so it's lovely to actually chat to somebody that we're, we're involved in. But um. Some of the stuff you said in there was fascinating. It reminded us that it's a fact when we heard a little bit more from in the house of what you guys got up to. So uh, if I may, I'll hand over to you for a little bit of intro, how you got into IP and your kind of your career. Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am delighted to be here. And also, I was particularly happy because that meant the article was good enough for you to want to <laughs> invite me to be here, which was, you know, positive feedback from the article. I followed probably a fairly standard path to many people into the patent profession. I did a degree in electronic engineering. I then went on to do a master's in medical electronics and physics. And then I actually got a job as a clinical researcher at the Royal Free Hospital in London, which I was due to start in the September of that year. And I'm not going to mention the year because that will give my age away instantly <laughs> and a few months before I started the job so maybe actually two months before I started the job my brother started dating a patent attorney and um, he called me up and said have you ever thought about being a patent attorney it may well be more lucrative than going to work for the NHS and so I did a little bit of research and thought actually it was a great way to use my technical background without actually having to go and sit in a lab so, you know, within two weeks, I changed the course of my future career and I never went and did the job in the hospital. So um, I have described it and I might have said it in the article as selling my soul. Um, and I will get back to that when I talk about a lecture, because that was my bit about trying to reclaim my soul. <laughs> but yeah, so then I uh, went to train at Beck Greener, private practice firm in central London, and I had a, you know, great experience there, fantastic training, met wonderful people, had a great few years of informals life as well. I, in that time, I was actually social sec and then honorary sec of informals as well. So got to know lots and lots of people in the pattern profession. 
And then post qualification started to get itchy feet. For me personally, the environment of sitting in an office and having most of my interactions with inventors and so on by telephone or by email, it wasn't necessarily for me. And one of my friends at the time as well had moved to BP. So she'd moved from private practice into industry. And I started to get a glimpse of what an in-house role would look like. And it was enough to make me, you know, start paying a bit of attention. And, you know, as chance goes, that was about the time that I got a phone call from a headhunter to say, are you interested in role? And they had roles at the time at Canon and Procter & Gamble. And so I thought, okay, let's, let's just give it a whirl. And I then got the Procter & Gamble job and took the job and went to work there. Right. I'm going to catch you. There's already so many questions before we go on to the next phase. You may not be expecting all of them. Apologise in advance. First of all, how did it go when you told those people you weren't going to start working for them? It was, well, (laughs) so the not telling the people bit was okay, but the bit that was horrific was... And this, I have to go back a step. When I went for my interview at Beck Greener, the staff partner asked me how I cope with stress. And I said, cool, calm and collected. You know, I'll assess, I'll take all the facts in, assess the situation, think about, you know, what needs to be done. And I'll come up with a sensible plan of action. When I said that I was going to take the job, they asked for references and I gave the name of my tutor on the master's course that I was doing. Unbeknown to me, he was best friends with the person at the hospital who had offered me the job and he refused to give me a reference. And I think he went further and he might have sworn at the staff partner from Beck Greener, who then called me up very kindly and nicely and said to me, we've got a little problem. I responded by bursting into tears and demonstrating my best stress coping mechanisms. But it was resolved because I then went back and gave the name of my tutor from my bachelor's degree and he gave a glowing reference. But um, unfortunately, that was the way in which it was communicated to the hospital that I was not going to go and do that job. So then when I actually told them, it was less of a surprise. So it went okay, but not that well. (laughs) Yeah, it was an interesting one. (laughs) And also, I mean, a lot of people want to know, did your brother marry the patent attorney? No. No. Can we take you back to your your time in the informals? You certainly can. How did How did you come to um, be on Resec? Well, I was social sec first. So I, I think I was social sec fairly early on after I joined the profession because I was just very sociable. So I think I had my first year of just attending things and then probably my second year after Queen Mary, actually. So I did the Queen Mary course. And on when I was on the Queen Mary course, I was the informal social sec of our Queen Mary course. And so I think it was a natural progression then when the year was coming to a close and they were looking for somebody to take on the role. I was happy to do it. I then had one year out where I was sitting some exams trivial things and so I had one year where I didn't do a formal role on informals and then the following year when they were looking for somebody to take over as honorary sec I was approached for the role and I find it hard to say no so yeah before the days and where the honorary sec now has a seat on council that's right yeah it was I mean at the time actually we were in we were fairly independent we were operating quite independently I mean we had to report into SEPA but we were still doing things pretty much by ourselves. And one of my proudest achievements actually in that time was to set up the funding for the regional drinks. That was one of the things that happened while I was on Resec. So, and that came from being social sec and realizing that actually we were far too London centric. And so, yeah, that, that was quite satisfying actually to be able to do that. I don't think I did anything else as on Resec. That's, that's fantastic. And we have the informals on occasionally, so it's it's quite nice to remind everyone of their existence. We have people listening from all over the place, don't necessarily, every podcast we've ever done. So again, the informals is the kind of the trainee branch, as it were, of the profession. Interestingly, I gather we're one of the few professions in the world, if, the, if not the only one in the world, that's actually got informals or anything like that. Because we are the envy 
for many reasons, but that's one of the reasons I think a lot of the other kind of uh, national professions have a look at us and think that's rather good. So thanks for actually thanks, thanks for reminding everybody of that um, because uh, it's, it's a nice little touch. And yeah, you get it's good. Are you still in touch with any informals now? I mean, it, I am best friends with many people that I was an informal with, and and actually, have most of my social life as an adult has you know <laughs> been born from from those Wednesday evening, you know, free happy hour drinks where we used to, and this is now reminiscing, this is back in the day. And for, for many of the people listening, they'll be like, you did what? We had to cut out the little tokens from the yellow pages. This is paper, guys. <laughs> Actual scissors and paper of cutting out tokens. And I'm really shocked that the partners in our firm did this, but they used to cut their tokens out and give them to us as well. <laughs> Therefore, basically disabling, you know, half of their working population on Thursday mornings. And I can't believe they willingly did this now, but thank you. It wasn't the highest security operation ever. I've I'm just a, given I'm away, actually, that era. we cheated. Yeah, sorry. Oh, don't worry. I, I, you may not be alone. Uh, no, I'm not going to say who else might have done that. Um, <clears throat> brilliant. Right. Sorry. Thank you for that. Back on track now. So private practice. You thought you'd move on to, to industry and you went to Procter and Gamble. Was it? PNG. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Go, 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 go. Go, go, go. Um, so Procter and Gamble um had recently acquired the Gillette business. And Gillette had an RD site in Boston in the US and one in Reading in the UK. And the vast majority of the Procter and Gamble attorneys in the UK, patents attorneys in the UK were chemistry focused people. And so Procter and & Gamble, and many industries have this as well, they are a pr- promote from within kind of company. So they prefer to bring people in as graduates and then train them up and then carry on. Um, so it was rare that they were hiring somebody with experience, but because they needed somebody with mechanical experience, they they employed somebody with an electronic engineering degree. But that's fine. That's how I sold myself at the time because I I enjoyed the mechanical work. And then that was fantastic, actually, because because Gillette was a recent acquisition, they didn't necessarily have all the systems in place. I was the only Gillette patent attorney in the UK. And for me, it was a wonderful opportunity to get really stuck in at the deep end in an in-house role. And one of the things that I always, always say is no two in-house roles are the same. It varies massively based on the size of the organization, the R&D setup that you're supporting, um, the product. Because, you know, if I just compare where I am now with Gillette, Gillette is a consumer goods, you know, it's a consumer goods company, but it's still one that has a huge capital investment in their, their handles. And then they have the, you know, the razors that are sold, that, you know, that's the part that they're making their money from. Other parts of Procter & Gamble were even quicker moving in terms of feminine care, for example. They would launch multiple products, you know, a month. And then you go to Electa, where I am now, where we launch a product every couple of years. So no two in-house roles are the same, but my Gillette role was amazing. The inventors were fantastic. They were super excited to have a patent attorney dedicated to them. And the particular part of Gillette that I supported was very much focused on front end innovation. So it was really the, you know, the blue sky thinking side of things. Um, the part in America was more focused on turning it into product. So fantastic experience. Um, and yeah, one that sold me fully on becoming an in-house attorney. Sounds a little bit stressful in terms of time pressure and things like that. Did you have hairy moments? That's a very relevant <laughs> question for Gillette. Sorry, that was on purpose. Uh, um, <laughs> dreadful, dreadful. Yeah, on purpose. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, in that time, actually, I don't know that there was time pressure necessarily, but some of the work that I did there was just amazing. I mean, we had litigation. You know, I I had never done any of these things before, but yeah, we had big, big litigation. I did arbitration while I was there. And that will bring me on something in my next phase of what I talk about. But, um, you know, some of the experiences that I had were just fantastic. There were some brilliant moments as well. Like um, I remember sitting in the office, you know, towards the end of the day and three of the senior managers kind of coming and sitting on my desk around me in a very ominous kind of way and sort of looking slightly shamefaced and saying, you know, we need to tell you something. 
And they took me into an office and we went into the office and I was like, what do you need to tell me? And they said, we received a document marked as confidential and we've accidentally opened it and it has, you know, competitor kind of information on it. I mean, that's the kind of thing that doesn't happen in private practice. You know, that's that's the kind of situation where you're suddenly like, I've never dealt with this before, but I need mm-hmm. to take control and I need to guide you yeah. on what to do. Other things that Gillette that are just amazing is, you know, the fact that you could go to the supermarket, buy a product, take it home and then look at it and say, oh, we've got patents that cover this, this and this. It, you know, it's just amazing. And I got to be really involved in a lot of their decision making, their commercial plans. I mean, they were very inclusive and it, it made my job for me, really. It was it was a wonderful opportunity. So you touch on your in, in the article as well the kind of the, the opportunity to engage with the business and actually be you know right in the middle of all of it and I guess that's something you've always been seeking. Yeah, absolutely. And I I would say that Gillette showed me what what the potential was, and and this is again you know you could go into another in house role somewhere else, and if they've got a very well established and large department, you may actually not get as much interaction with the business as I had at Gillette. And for me, it definitely told me and informed me what I like about the role. And I loved that. I loved being immersed in it all. I, you know, I also really loved the whole um, being able to go down to the workshop and and see things. You know, they had rapid prototyping equipment. It was amazing. And the other thing at Gillette that was super cool, you know, maybe I have to share, you love to get photos out there at some point, but it's things <laughs> like they um, were supporting Movember because that's, you know, a charity that, sits with Gillette as well and you know it's a good charity to support and I had a black beetle at the time and then I was you know slightly out there and um they helped me make a pink mustache for my black beetle <laughs> to wear throughout November to support November and you know they had the equipment and the means to do that it was amazing like, you know I'm shocked that they wanted to but yeah it was it, it was fun as well as work-wise informative and educational and interesting yeah and some for private practice that's not something we haven't got the kit to make car-sized pink mm-hmm. mustaches so no, i don't know many many reasons <laughs> um so you like carry on where were we so we're at procter and gamble we're in the gillette work and there's some international travel coming up i know that's all exciting stuff yeah so that was the next step so from gillette then um and this is you know the world is very small and be nice to people because you never know where, when they're going to show up in your life again the manager that i had who was based in boston um when i took on the gillette role stayed within procter and gamble but moved to china and she then was moving from China to Singapore to help set up an R&D department in Singapore and to provide them with the patent support in Singapore. And it, through her and various other cogs that work within the Procter & Gamble machine, I was asked if I would like the opportunity to go and live in Singapore and help establish the patent department for the new R&D site that was being set up in Singapore. And obviously I bit their hands off. I mean, I you don't get opportunities like that often and so off I went to Singapore in 2013 and again super amazing I was then supporting Procter & Gamble's beauty prestige and packaging businesses which let's remember I'm an electronic engineer (laughs) (laughs) I was suddenly doing chemical patents and you know another tip I've got is leave the company before they come back to bite you (laughs) Um, Yeah, I was handling chemical work and I was doing lots of material science stuff as well. But um, the the things about that role that were really unique and interesting to me were, number one, the fact that this was a brand new organisation. So the people who were there, they had no private patent experience from the past. So there was a huge amount of training. There was putting systems in place helping them understand, you know, the Procter & Gamble way of handling patents, freedom to operate. You know, it was it was a very, very different world in the beauty care and prestige world for freedom to operate than it was for Gillette. You know, way more competitors, more very incremental kind of changes. So, you know, being able to put processes in place for that was really cool. And then the other part that I really, really enjoyed when I was in Singapore was that they did a lot more third party collaboration. And so I was able to get involved in negotiations um, the contractual side of things. 
And again, you know, I found that super interesting. You know, I, I really, really enjoyed those interactions. And then on top of that, there's the cultural aspect of it all. I mean, suddenly, you know, having to add in the dynamic of different cultures, for example, while you're negotiating, you know, that's that's a whole other level of experience that I wouldn't have had without that job. Brilliant. So I know then Singapore, you didn't come straight back from Singapore. Is that correct? I love this. This is like, this is like Desert Island Discs. Yeah, I have to add something to... about my Singapore time, by the way. Oh, sorry, sorry. Go, go. No, no, it's a complete curveball because it's got nothing to do with patents whatsoever. <laughs> but I became a Dragon Boat champion while at, living in Singapore. <laughs> wow. There's just little known facts about me. Um, I took up Dragon Boating when I moved there just to meet people. I joined a German team. They had good beer and good looking people. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I joined the team and probably 18 months into my time of mostly drinking and socializing, um, decided that actually I either needed to take it seriously or quit. And I decided to take it seriously. And the team then kind of went on this path of um, we got a new coach and the coach had, you know, his eyes set on some international competitions and we ended up getting really, really good and ended up taking it really seriously. I won numerous gold medals sitting (laughs) on a boat there. We went to Australia and took part in like this big international competition for amateurs and did really, really well. Um, So yeah, just a complete tangent, but my boss, the one that had been fundamental in me moving to Singapore, once took me to an event and introduced me as a dragon boater who did patents in her spare time. <laughs> you got you are quite busy with it. So this is a mixed boat or a women's boat or how did it work? My speciality was the women's boat, but we did have mixed boats. But I, my, the place I was sitting was the front seat on the left. So dragon boating, take a look those people you know online because I'm I'm doing hand signals at the minute um you sit on one side of the boat and then you have a partner who sits on the other side of the boat and um I was sitting in the front row where we had to sort of set the speed for the boat and set the rhythm for the boat so I wasn't the strongest I wasn't the quickest but I was maybe better at just maintaining metronomic yeah metronomic yeah and so yeah predominantly 12 person ladies boat that was my specialty are you still in touch with that boat? That sounds like I'm sure that's significant bonding experience. Yeah. And again, and this will bring me on to the next part of my journey. Because that was, <laughs> let's remember, that was a German dragon boat team. Oh, yes. I then moved to Germany with Procter and Gamble. So before we get to that, Neil, have you ever been dragon boating? No, I mean, I've seen it on the telly. It looks like a full-on activity. I'm very impressed, Matisha. I mean, you've got to be fit to do that, surely really fit yeah I mean I wasn't at the beginning I was at the end (laughs) we got a drummer at the front haven't you bonging away as well yeah but the drummer is just for competitions and for fun so the drummer and 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 to encourage but the drummer doesn't actually sort of set the rhythm the drummer's just part of the show I mean it's quite theatrical when when you're in races and you've got a drummer sitting on the front it is it's quite special but yeah the drummer's not normally there Ah, I didn't realise that. It kind of makes sense. Okay, good. So you had to ignore what the drummer was doing. Well, you hoped the drummer would follow you rather than, okay. you know. Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh, so you had a position of significant responsibility in the boat as well. I mean, I like to think so. If they listen to the podcast, <laughs> they may disagree. But let... <laughs> but actually, do you know what? It's, it's a really important subject, though, that nothing teaches you about teamwork and about leadership, but you know, all of the skills that you might ever need in the workplace are transferable. And likewise, from in the converse, all of the skills that I picked up in the Dragon Boat team about working together, you know, about how to lead, all of those things, about staying cool under pressure, all of those skills are transferable into the workplace. And I like to think it's helped make me better, you know, at everything else that I do as well. Brilliant. Have you done any dragon boating outside of Singapore in any other countries? Yeah, I tried it in Germany. It's very cold. And they, <laughs> they shout at you in German and it doesn't sound quite as... It sounds Exotic. a little bit more... <laughs> uh. 
And you're right. So beautifully, we got to Germany. Yes. So while I was in Singapore, P&G downsized their UK operation and my return home stopped stopped slightly short of the UK and I landed in Germany as my home destination instead of the UK. And so I went to work in Frankfurt at the Procter & Gamble office there. And there I was supporting Femcare and packaging for Femcare. So that was, you know, for me, the technology was amazing there as well. It was, I would say it was a better fit for me, perhaps, than the lotions and potions that I was dealing with in Singapore. But um it's something that I cared about. And yeah, femcare products have got a huge place in the world. I got to work on menstrual cups while I was there as well, which they have subsequently launched. And yeah, it was a great, it, that was another great experience. I would say the main difference for me there was that the patent department in Germany was long established and it was large. And that perhaps wasn't the best fit for me. And- Thing. Yeah. So cause, as you said, in Singapore, you're at the beginning, you could kind of, you had some role in shaping it, whereas here, you had to take it or leave it kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And it sounds kind of wrong, perhaps, but it was more of a traditional patent role of prep, prosecution. Right. So you, you, come, you come back a bit. Okay. Yeah. And so, and it, that's all great. And, you know, it was good for me in a way to kind of come back to that and to reestablish that I could actually do that. But I think for me, the interest that I have in all the other stuff, in the establishing the department, in being more involved in the commercial side of things, all of that kind of thing was probably something that I was missing in Germany. Okay. And the dragon boating was rubbish. And the dragon boating was cold, yes. (laughs) So, but yeah, so you, you came back and I think this is where Electra appears, is that right? This is where Electra appears, yeah. So I I kind of had in my mind that maybe it was time to kind of actually come home. And that's when the elected job appeared. And the other thing for me in this, which is where I talk about my soul again, is that while I absolutely loved my time at Procter & Gamble, and I had some experiences that I would never, ever have had were it not for Procter & Gamble, my heart kind of sat with where I had began, which was in the medical device world. Um, And that's where Electa kind of slotted in perfectly because you know, electors, is medical devices, uh, radiotherapy equipment, treating cancer. You couldn't, A, you couldn't get a better match from a technology point of view with what I had actually studied. But also, if I was looking for something that was going to nourish me, elector was the absolute dream job for me. And then added to that, the fact that elector is still a growing company, both in terms of, I mean, irrespective of size, just in maturity levels, it's still growing. And the department, the IP department was still, you know, in a slightly less developed kind of form. And it's a small department and we cover many, many businesses. It's global. You know, there are so many things that Electa had to offer that I was kind of missing in Germany at the time, that it was a bit of a no brainer for me to say, okay, let's, let's go with that. So, in terms of the, the technology that Electa is, is innovating, how important do you think that is, if that's not a, a really stupid question? I mean, Electa's tagline is that Electa's there until cancer isn't. Radiotherapy plays a part in the overall host of different treatments that there are for cancer. Sure. And actually, radiotherapy, there's probably a barrier for some places for radiotherapy because of the cost and the size of the equipment but I mean it pays it plays a significant role in treatment of cancer and there are some cancers that are served better by radiotherapy it complements some other treatments as well and ultimately it plays a part in prolonging people's lives yeah yeah so is it is it down to size though that um is it restricted to a certain size of cancer or tumour that major surgery can treat? No, it's. Right? I think it's got more to do with the nature of the cancer uh-huh. and and probably something to do with whether or not it's primary, secondary cancer as well. But yeah, it, it, because radiotherapy can target small cancers as much as it can do, you know, large tumours as well. 
Okay, thanks. I mean, from the, as I said, I'm, I'm, I love working with Alexa personally, an amazing piece of kit. And my most exciting thing is that it's the only time I've ever had to deal with relativity in an invention, <laughs> Linux. It's just, that's so exciting. Uh, I think we can talk about the poor man's proton. I think it's a, that's the thing that they talk about. It seems to be something in the, the business more broadly, which is that they make the electrons go so fast that they put on the mass that they kind of they get the same kind of impact as a proton does, which is a thousand times heavier or something. Stuff like yeah. that. Unbelievable. I mean, the, the other the other beauty of Electra and the machines that Electra has as well is that if you look at the evolution of radiotherapy over the last like 20 years, I think it's got a bad press historically because the technology wasn't sophisticated enough to be able to isolate the tumor. And so you would end up having to treat healthy tissue. And that's not desirable, right? Because then that would make the person more poorly as a result of the radiotherapy rather than just targeting the tumour and treating the cancer. Whereas over time, the technology has progressed so significantly that now you can isolate the tumour, you can track the tumour in real time so that you minimise the dose to healthy tissue and you apply as much of the dose as possible to the tumor itself. And, and that's been the game changer. And I think that's where hopefully now it will gather more speed and interest. And you know, people, people will find the money and the resources and the bunkers that they need to be able to host the machines so that they can treat more people with it. Well, this and this continues the kind of your trajectory through the the the, the in-house side of things. And you, you come up with a whole bunch of reasons to be in-house. I've picked up engagement with the business, the variety of different things you do, plus more and more interaction with people, plus plus the day job, as you mentioned, you know, you still get to check, you can do that occasionally. And of course, the ability to source a large pink moustache at the drop of a hat, uh, all these things. Um, private practice, not for you then? <laughs> I mean, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know the the prospect of yeah honestly i it's really it's really really bad because obviously we really love working with you guys and Gulen, we you know we work with you and your team very closely and i absolutely love it and i admire everything that you do and i think it's amazing but it makes my blood run cold <laughs> but again it comes back to the whole thing of um the different in-house roles that you can get as well, because there would be in-house roles that would leave me with the same reaction as well. You know, there's there's something about the slightly chaotic environment in which we're working at Electa, which is a wonderfully chaotic environment that sparks my enthusiasm and, and helps me thrive, I think. I just wondered if we could get into the the issue of why over the over recent years anyway, we've seen a reduction in our members going into in-house roles. There seem to be um, a smaller percentage of patent attorneys going in-house. Seems to be a trend. Yeah, I mean, I think there are probably a fewer in-house roles. I've gone through at both Procter & Gamble and Electa, you know, what we would call resilience programmes, and there have been major challenges on companies recently. And I, I think a lot of departments have significantly downsized and a lot of departments have discovered that actually you don't need to employ patent attorneys to do the day job. You need patent attorneys to come and do all the other stuff and to, you know, to, to still be instrumental in the drafting and the prosecution side of things. But actually, that's the part that we you don't need to employ people to do. But that's the part, part that can be farmed out. The part that you really need people in the house to do is the engagement with the inventors, the ongoing training, awareness, the strategic discussions, the making sure that your portfolio is commercially relevant, making sure that you're on top of matters for potential infringement and, and actually being on the defensive litigation as well, which is something that, you know, I've experienced both at Gillette and, sorry, both at Procter & Gamble and at Electa. So I think a lot of departments have just become smaller. And so, I, you know, I think there are just maybe fewer in-house roles. And then it's potentially that the in-house roles that exist, I mean, I don't know what all the departments look like, but um, 
you know, perhaps not enough people have read my article. Maybe there's going to be a change now after this podcast goes out where everybody suddenly just downs tools and says, I need to move in-house. I mean, do you think it's been a good thing for the profession to have this movement of attorneys across the divide, so to speak? 100 percent. Yeah, I I think the best patent attorneys will have experience from both kind of sectors. And that can come. It doesn't have to be that you have to have a job in private practice and job in the industry to have the experience. I mean, we've worked so closely with Kilburn and Strode, for example. We've hosted secondes. You know, that's a great way to do it as well, to just live the life of the people on the other side. And I I think, I mean, Gwilym might uh, disagree, but I hope that I'm better to work with as an in-house attorney because I came from private practice because I know I know the challenges that you face in private practice. I know what the job looks like and that I know what what kind of thing you need on the private practice side. And so the way the way I see it is that the best thing to do is to just be a partnership. And the best way to be a partnership is to put yourself in the shoes of the other people and to know, you know, what matters to them. And on the flip side for me as well, it's really important for me that the outside council that we work with gets engaged and immersed so we do things like we host elector days where we'll invite our outside council in and we'll show them the machines and they'll meet the inventors so it's real to them it's we I I do not just want to be an email address or a you know a pigeonhole It, it shouldn't be black box work it should be immersive and it should be a partnership and that's when I think you get the value out of both sides so yeah I I think it would be good if if it was mandatory for everybody to have to do a little stint in in the house you know I think it would be great I think it would make the private practice profession so much better to know what kind of pressures we face as well because we have the opposite thing where um you might have a deadline in private practice for filing a response to something and the private practice attorneys might just be thinking oh my gosh Vandita's is just like super slow whereas I'll be sat there going hey inventors like come on I need your input on this I I can't do it without you and you know there are all these other pressures that we deal with in-house that the private practice attorneys wouldn't necessarily know about so getting that insight into each other's roles I think is critical the last few years, I've recognised that private practice. We, we do. We're very proud of what we do, and you're. I thank you for your. You know, you know what we do, and you may not want to do it, but it's it's a tough old job. But we're kind of the foot soldiers sometimes. I find you know we're going in doing the individual skirmishes and the little battles, be that the drafts and the prosecution and the hearings and all that kind of thing. But there's this kind of bigger battle going on that you know sometimes. I, I love working with people like yourself because you let us in and you let us know what's going on. And I think pure arms length work would be would be quite soul destroying, or certainly a different proposition anyway so yeah there you go there's the calls going out let's get more people in into in-house but i mean just quickly on that actually i suppose one of the issues is whether those jobs are there in the sense that people are looking to the outsourcing model but presumably something's being lost if you don't if, if you outsource everything however good your patent attorney is externally they still can't come in and do the same job you're just not going to get the, the depth of um of, of immersion presumably yeah I, I certainly think you can't outsource everything and i would never advocate for it otherwise i'd be immediately talking myself out of a job anyway there are there are <laughs> things that you can only do if you're in-house but yeah i think i think it just comes down to a bit of a how much time you know we could have a bigger department and then sit and have people do drafting and prosecution work But the reality, I think, is that even if our department grew, all we'd be doing is finding more issues internally that need to be resolved. And we probably still wouldn't be the best people to do the drafting and prosecution work because we still probably wouldn't have the same time and dedicated time available to us to do the best job at that. And for me, I think particularly with drafting, if you're not doing it day in, day out, it takes you longer to do it. And so... For me, it's, uh, yeah, the the balance isn't right to say I could do some drafting, but because I've got so many other things going on in my headspace, it would be hard for me to dedicate the time to do the drafting. And then if I'm only doing like one draft a month, I'm just not going to be as quick as somebody who's doing it daily. 
so I think it's just a bit of a false economy sometimes to try and build that kind of department where you would do everything in the house. So when private practice attorneys come to their in-house instructor, what sort of things for private practitioners be saying to delight you? Oh, it, the things that they'd be saying to delight me would be asking questions to help build their commercial awareness behind the inventions. So, you know, if if you get sent an invention disclosure, for example, and someone's asking me, is this something that's going to be used in a product or what are the critical aspects of this that you're going to be selling? You know, if I think about Procter & Gamble, which was very much a marketing company, the things that you want the patents for are the things that you're really going to be commercializing because that's the bit that your competitor is going to try and advertise to compete with you. So if somebody is asking, what are the critical things about this that we need to know from a commercial point of view as well, then that's super important. Asking about the value actually is is a great starting point. Don't just assume that every patent has the same value to a company. And so it might be, and we, you know, we've got this kind of set up that we might say we can go cheap and cheerful with some things because we need a patent for it, but actually we don't think it's it's as valuable as other patents might be. And other ones we want to go to town on because we see, you know, they have huge commercial value. So that's that would be one of the key points. Cool. So we go Neil for our promo. That, that, that's that's how we get a lot of people tuning in. <laughs> how to delight your instructor. Um, thank you. So we've moved slowly towards here, but one thing that I've witnessed and I know it's been really good from Elector um has been their kind of recognizing the work life balance and letting you know letting their employees and, and, and kind of balance those things. Is there anything you want to share on your story there? Yeah, absolutely. There's a significant event that's happened in my life since I came to work at Elector. So I came to work at Elector four years ago, and one of my other motivations for wanting to move home and be near my family was that I decided to have a family by myself. So I decided to go through the adoption process as a solo adopter. And I did that after I'd been at Elector for six months, I officially started the adoption process. Um, Four, five months later, we entered lockdown, which added a whole other level to to my journey. But um, in September of 2020, I brought home my little girl and um, I took one year off for adoption leave. And yeah, my experience at Electa has been entirely, entirely supportive. You know, from the minute that I announced that I was going through the adoption process, I've had nothing but support from the company. And it's super important, you know, check for those that are new to adoption that don't really understand. And this is something that private practice, everybody, you know, can look at, check your policies, make sure that adoption has got the same rights as maternity policies as well um adoption might also be solo men and same sex partners you know it's it's a different it's just a different kind of setup perhaps to what would be conventional but yeah please check your policies to anybody who's listening to this but yeah it's been super important to me to be able to balance my home life which is now me caring for a now four-year-old little girl who is very lively. I mean, she's very cute, but she takes up a lot of my energy. She is also teaching me life skills, by the way, and skills that are transferable to the role. Nobody negotiates the way she negotiates. So, you know, if if I can persuade her to put socks on and leave the house, then I think I can get inventors to share their inventions with me. (laughs) Or I think I could, you know, persuade a company to assign their IP rights to us as part of a collaboration you know if if I feel like if that's my minor victory for the day I can go to work and do anything but yeah COVID has actually been super helpful as well in an ironic way because COVID meant that the whole world moved online and it's meant that Elector as well as many other companies have moved to this hybrid working model where I'm not in the office every single day which which again is super helpful because it means I can be there for drop off and pick up being able to use teams and and having the flexibility to manage my day the way I need to manage it 
has been, you know, very important to being able to do this alone. Um, and that was it, that I needed to have the confidence that I could do it alone in the place that I was working and that I was fully supported before I went ahead and did it. And I'm now working part time. So I work eight, an 80 percent schedule. So I don't work on Fridays um, and that will evolve when she starts school. So I'll then do Monday to Fridays. And yeah, it's it's fantastic to have a company that supports that and you know champions it not just supports it actually they're they're really they're really supportive and they've encouraged this and they care about me and they care about her um and actually you know I've been sharing our journey with Kilburn and Strode as well so Gwilym and Co you know everybody's kind of come along on the ride with me and it yeah it's been it's been a fundamental part of my time at the lecture amazing it's like you think we're all getting together soon in the soft place you can know your, your daughter can meet my baby yeah. as well and, and James is and then Emily and Tom are going to come along as well and just check out it all goes it's all, all great I've said to you before it's a lovely story it's inspirational and I think you look pretty happy I'm pretty happy yeah I like my life <laughs> I'm so pleased by that oh uh, it's no it's, it's a, such a lovely story and the IP inclusive have got the the non-traditional family network they have yeah they I have not massively engaged yet just because of a time issue but yeah they have and you know it's great to see and you know actually I this is another thing that I champion in Electra as well the whole focus on diversity inclusion you know it really does matter it really does impact people and the pattern profession has still got quite a way to go and you know having things like the IP inclusive program you know that that's super helpful in it it just means that we you know if you're in my kind of situation as a single parent you know that there are other people out there who are in the same boat as you and you know that there are people who are championing the cause but again as i said i think the ip profession there's still a lot more that can be done and actually in the house maybe has got that slight perk in that it's not something new in house because elector you know they're they're dealing with people with all sorts of kind of backgrounds and histories and family situations and yeah it, it wasn't new to Alexa, basically. Thank you for all of that. Thank you for sharing that bit as well. That's, um, it's a lovely message for everybody, I think. Coming to an end, we always have our question at the end. If you listen, but we, we try and have a question at the end. And Nula, I'll tell this one slightly differently for you, but Dan Dieter, I'll just go back to the, um, the, the Procter & Gamble time. Nice, simple one. What was your favourite product through all those different iterations? What was the one that caught your eye most? Which would you want to most talk about? That's a tough one. Um, I but the one that's popped into my head immediately is going to be the menstrual cup and that was one of the last things that I worked on and one of the things I loved about it and this will tie in now I don't know when this podcast goes out but next week it's um, World Intellectual Property Day and the focus this year is on championing women innovators the team at Procter & Gamble that worked on the menstrual cup was all female and we're, we're Procter, I say we, I'm not at Procter & Gamble anymore, but that's how much I cared about it. They weren't the first to come mm. out with a menstrual cup, but the menstrual cup is such a life-changing product for so many people, as were tampons, you know, as were all of these kind of female hygiene sort of products that are critical um, to people's lives. So it was, yeah, it was a pleasure to work on that. And actually the team that was working on it was based in the US. And when I heard that we had a team working on it, I actually just said, I, I'm your patent attorney. That's, you need me. And so they they were like, go ahead, do it. Uh, so yeah, that's probably one of the most, but there were so many. No, no, but one will do, but that, thank you thank you for that. We we, had, we actually talked to LV recently. I heard it, yeah. I don't think in that one. Yeah, yeah, but it's again fascinating, the whole femtech side yeah. of things. Yeah. Everyone, which also had Emily on it. There we yes. go. Everyone's just all tying together. Neil, I'm not going to ask you quite the same question, but what's your favourite personal care product? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I found a very good, decent man's moisturiser that they sell very cheaply in, I believe it's Aldi. Oh, gosh, that's a sore point for somebody who used to work at Procter & Gamble. Is it? <laughs> oh, dear. Sorry. I said the wrong thing. 
Oh, I might get, I might catch up with you offline and get worried about your wrinkles. Um, <laughs> I've got, I, I, so I'm going to answer my own question as well. Um, which I, I just had my first. Men can moisturise now, can't they? Men can, absolutely, hundred percent should moisturise. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I, need, I need it. Look, I'm getting all pruney. I'm now having my first pimple for about 15 years this week, and I've been using tea tree oil. Ah, excellent product. Great stuff. Great. But unfortunately, the pimples run under my nose, so it's like getting smelling salts every time I inhale, which is a yeah. slight problem. You can't see it. Don't worry. Don't don't zoom in, everybody. I'm, I'm not zoom in. Good. Old question to end on, but that's what we do. I was looking at the time and thinking, gosh, how, you know, that's a good sign when you think, how do we get here? Uh, I was like, I could have gone on as well. Neil doesn't know about my improvisation life. That I what? had that on my list. Did I did have that on my list. But um, what I kind thought, of improvisation? You know, Comedy improvisation. Oh wow! Really? Yeah. Which is also another one that you know is uh, very very useful in all scenarios. But I took that up when I went to Germany because this is what I do. I move to a country, I find a hobby, then apparently it's just a stand up comedy. Not quite stand up comedy, but it's it, a bit like it, it's whose line is it anyway? Is that the one that I'm thinking yeah. about? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's it's really good. And then when I moved back to the UK, that I took it up in the UK, and yeah, it's been it's been really really good. It's really it's super fun. I encourage people to try it. Well, I, oh, I was cool. actually thinking because we, we occasionally try to work out how to get our partners to be a bit more creative, and it did occur to me that doing an improv workshop might be a really good way to get them right out of their comfort zones, but also fun. You know, on the real, it's yeah. fun. I'm on, get them on the roll. Absolutely, yeah. I, I, well, you know, Lydia, my other half, did it as well. I yeah, think of course, the same, yeah, the same one. Yeah. yeah, we've had many conversations about it, but but yeah, th- that was. Um, thank you very much. That was a nice chat. What's the funniest bit of improv you've come up with? Man? <laughs> you know, you you know what? Uh, we can I, cut it back I in. I think my best bit of improv it was not was not necessarily funny, but it was very emotional. So I did one course, and it was. Um, it was all about emotions and tapping into emotions. And of course the emotions can be super funny, but the best one I think I've done was a live show that we did. So at the end of a course, you always do a show. And um, the format of the show was that you had three people stand on one side, three people stand on the other side of the stage. And then you had to go onto stage and you kept cycling between the three people um, and you would have to keep the story with the person, with the same person running throughout. So let's say I went on stage with person one, then we'd start a story. And the idea was that the first time you met would be the first time you met that person in improv world. And then the next time you met them would be after five, 10 years. And then the next time would be, you know, end of life or whatever it would be. And um, there was one guy in that and the first scene that we had together he gave me a box of chocolates and we had a nice date and it was all very basic the second time we met uh, but it would have been our first date the second time we met on stage um he gave me a box of chocolates and we were obviously celebrating like our 10th anniversary or something anyway we were celebrating something and we had a lovely lovely time the third time we met on stage he handed me a packet of crisps so this is improv world so it's pretend right so he gives me something and I I think in fact he kind of threw it at me which is what started the whole scene off and I then responded with uh, something along the lines of you know oh so this is where we've reached now on our anniversary you're giving me crisps and they're not just any crisps they're already salted like what kind of metaphor <laughs> you know and it, it turned into this massive row on stage between me and him about the crisps and 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 we ended it and and then all like it climaxed and climaxed with the argument and it was really awful like I was really upset on stage like actually oh upset on stage and then it ended with a cuddle and us sitting next to each other and me putting my head on his shoulder and everyone was crying and it was just oh it was goodness. just bizarre but like I felt it like I felt it but it was basically probably very typical of every relationship in the world where you know as you kind of progress down the years you have these moments and yeah our anniversary yeah. him giving me a packet of ready salted crisps was like the trigger to spark the argument but then we ended up as you know best friends again and yeah this just, just Neil get us back in the podcast <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Um, oh, yeah, when I watched it, I just got stressful. Really? Yeah, just, oh, I just, I, I felt for people on stage, but of course they're in the zone and they're loving it, but I just put myself in their studio thinking, no, 
for Palace. It, I mean, it is hard though. It's completely out of your comfort zone. But again, the one of the and I've just done it to you then, which is really awful based on what I'm about to say. But one of the skills that improv teaches you, which I think again that every patent attorney needs, is the skill to listen before you offer up your thoughts. And it's completely undervalued. And and you might want to put this in the podcast, but speaking to inventors in particular, I say to everybody, particularly people who I'm coaching or training, ask an open-ended question and then leave them because they need time to get to their, you know, their, their, story that they need to tell you you might want to add prompts in but give them time and let them kind of speak and talk yeah and I loved in the I think in the theater that you guys had they had written up on the wall yes, yes comma, and, and. yeah and I love I think that's something again in terms of take I mean I didn't do the improv but I saw that on the wall <laughs> I quite like yeah. that so you know don't never don't say no don't close the conversation go carry it on and build, build on it and that's actually really useful advice. yeah it's been absolutely uh, fantastic. Neil, thanks as ever for, for joining thanks. in. Thanks, Wendy. And our best wishes to Lee, as, as we always do. Bandita on sea has been really, really good fun. Um, I did a lot of that, but not some of the details. So that, that was fantastic. Uh, it's always great to see you. Uh, and um, yeah, hopefully your daughter can enjoy listening to her mum's voice soon. Hopefully. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Thanks. thanks. Bye. Bye.